Hello, today we're going to talk about giant cell arteritis. Now, giant cell arteritis is also known as temporal arteritis. It is a form of vasculitis. Vasculitis means inflammation of blood vessels. It's an autoimmune disease that causes this. And for giant cell arteritis in particular, it's inflammation of larger and medium-sized blood vessels. In fact, it's probably the most common cause of a vasculitis for larger blood vessels and one of the more common causes of vasculitis overall. Giant cell arteritis, because of that inflammation, it causes interruption of blood flow. The blood can't get through the blood vessels it normally can because of the inflammation blocking it. And that, as a result, can cause pain, inflammation, and tenderness around the temples on the side of your head. In some people, that lack of blood flow can actually cause blindness or partial loss of vision. Because of that, it's really important to identify and correctly diagnose giant cell arteritis as quickly as possible so treatment can be started as quickly as possible to prevent that from happening. There are blood vessels that are more likely for this to happen than others, uh, particularly the temporal arteries, which is another reason why it's called temporal arteritis, so the arteries on the side of the head. You could actually also see it in the very large blood vessel called the aorta, which is the largest one that we, uh, we have coming in, in our body that comes out of the heart, um, which sometimes can happen as well. So why does giant cell arteritis happen? So it's essentially a dysfunction in the immune system, for reasons we don't fully understand, which attacks the blood vessel walls in those larger blood vessels and causes them to swell, to have inflammation, and as a result, it becomes narrower. Less blood flow happens, as we said, and we don't know why it happens. So there's no specific trigger that we've been able to identify. Although certainly age plays a role. We know it happens in older folks. And there may be a, uh, a factor for genes and environment, but we don't fully understand what that is. So GCA almost exclusively happens in adults over the age of 50. It would be very unusual to identify someone younger than 50 for this to happen, although there are other types of vasculitis, including large vessel vasculitides that you can see in younger folks, and probably most common between the ages 70 and 80. It affects females more often than males. And polymyalgia rheumatica, which we cover on our website as well as in other videos, um, you often will see in giant cell arteritis. A small portion of folks with polymyalgia rheumatica will have giant cell arteritis, but a larger portion of people with giant cell arteritis do end up having polymyalgia rheumatica at the same time. What sort of symptoms can you get with giant cell arteritis? Well, there's a host of different ones, but being more common, so headache is probably the one that we see the most often. And it's not your typical headache, but usually different than a normal pattern of headache if you're someone who gets headaches uh, on a usual basis. Your scalp may be tender to, to touch. Folks can have jaw pain or tongue pain, particularly with chewing, that gets better with rest. So it's not pain that's just there, but the more you use it, actually, the more you feel it. You can have uh, more, le more uh, symptoms that are less specific, so a fever that doesn't quite fit, weight loss, night sweats, fatigue. And as we talked about earlier, you can have sudden vision loss, so just complete loss of vision, often just in one eye, but also double vision um, because one eye isn't quite working as well as the other, so they're not lining up. How's your giant cell arteritis diagnosed? Well, listening to your story Listening for components that we've talked about is really important in those symptoms. We do a good physical exam. So we look for and feel a temporal artery to see, is it swollen? We feel for tenderness. We check pulses throughout to see if there's any changes there. And sometimes we need an eye specialist, an ophthalmologist, to do a specialty eye exam. Sometimes they can see some uh, artery and blood vessel changes in the back of the eye. There are some blood tests that we can do looking for markers of inflammation. They're not specific for giant cell arteritis, but in the right picture, the vast majority of time, we will see that they are very elevated in patients with giant cell arteritis. But there really is no specific test that we have 
that definitively says giant cell, either one has giant cell arteritis, at least based on blood tests. And that's why we often will get a biopsy. In fact, a biopsy of that temporal or artery, it's not a major surgery. It can usually be done at the bedside. And a small sample is taken where you can look for signs that can be quite uh, consistent with giant cell arteritis and is a very good way to make that diagnosis. Today, there are growing techniques to help make that diagnosis using imaging, uh, including a ultrasound of that temporal artery, as well as something called positron emission tomography, or a PET scan, which some kind, sometimes can see evidence of that inflammation in the right blood vessels, which again, if it fits with the story and what we're seeing on the exam, can be very helpful to make that diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. So how is this treated? So most important is the use of steroids. The first step is usually higher dose prednisone. Uh, prednisone is a type of steroid you could take by, uh, by mouth. You would take it every day in the morning. And we have other information on prednisone elsewhere um, here as well as our website. And really to dampen the immune response so it takes away that inflammation and does it really quickly so we prevent any risk of vision loss. If we're able to get on prednisone, that risk of vision loss goes from quite high to no more than 1% right away, which is really encouraging. That prednisone makes most people feel better very fast, usually within a couple days, most people within a couple of weeks. Prednisone needs to be taken though for quite a long time. Often it's about one year, some people a little bit longer, but it's not high dose the entire time. It starts quite high and then it's necessary to very slowly, but carefully and gradually lower that dose. And by doing it in a slow and gradual way, it usually prevents recurrence of symptoms of, and of that inflammation. And we're able to successfully come off that prednisone in about a year and continue to do well without further treatment. There are growing medications which may help reduce the need for taking prednisone the entire time. So steroid sparing, prednisone sparing medications. Some, for some people, they're appropriate to use right off the bat at the time of diagnosis. For many folks, we use them a little bit later on if that prednisone taper isn't going as well as we'd like because we know it's really important to get off that prednisone because of the side effects that it can cause if we're on it for too long. What else do we do in terms of that treatment phase? So some rheumatologists, some physicians will continue to monitor your blood work for that uh, marker for inflammation. Not everyone does, but that is uh, often kind of the best test if one is going to do anything. You're gonna to continue to follow with your rheumatologist or physician to make sure things are going well and make sure you have a good plan to lower that prednisone over time. We want to stay active. It helps bone health. It helps muscles stay strong, particularly. These are important things uh, when you're on prednisone to really help. And bone health is really important on prednisone. Prednisone can sometimes cause thinning of the bones or osteoporosis. By taking vitamin D, making sure you have appropriate calcium intake, that can really help in that regard. For more on giant cell arteritis, the treatment options, polymaltraumatica, really anything related to rheumatology, please feel free to check out many of our other videos here or visit us on our website at albertarheumatology.com.